I don't want to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because I know there are so many people from all over the world. So instead, I will just say hello and greetings and welcome. And thank you really all so much for joining us today. We have a terrific audience tuning in from all over the world. And I know that this isn't your first Zoom call, especially over the last few months. So along the same lines, knowing that this isn't your first Zoom call and Zoom fatigue is real, we are really delighted that you chose to spend the next hour with us. Personally though, I love looking at everyone's houses like in the background. I'll try not to get distracted by that though and be focused on today's conversation. Um, I am thrilled to be moderating today's global webinar with Scott Sagan and Alan Weiner, two of the three authors behind the very provocative and quite brilliant paper in the latest edition of the Bulletin, Why the Atomic Bombing of Hiroshima Would Be Illegal Today. Incidentally, the third co-author, who is actually the first author of the paper, Katie McKinney, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but I still wanted her, her name to be mentioned in this um, session. Scott Sagan is a political scientist based at Stanford University, and he's a member of the Bulletin Science and Security Board. Alan Weiner is an international legal scholar also based at Stanford University. What I'm going to do for the next 30 minutes or so is to engage in a, question, a back and forth conversation with both Scott and Alan, and then I'm going to turn it over to you for you all to ask your questions. Now, as Scott and Alan are speaking, if they say anything that you would like further clarification or you have a question that kind of stems from what they say, I would encourage you to please drop it in the chat box so that when we move from the conversation to the Q&A, we can have a number of questions ready to go to ask both our excellent uh, speakers today. Um, so I will obviously let Alan and Scott talk about their excellent paper, but I just wanted to kind of set it up for all of you. I mean, I'm sure you've all read it multiple times and you're, you've come with, you know, burning questions. But as I read it, five really interesting and quite fascinating things struck out for me. First of all, the timing. This week marks the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Second, the questions the paper raises surrounding the illegality of the use of nuclear weapons. Was it illegal to drop the bomb 75 years ago? Third, there's a very subtle but gentle reminder that just because something is illegal doesn't mean it won't get done, especially if national security is at risk. And on, along the same lines, we can't always acknowledge that countries around the world will always follow the law if they feel that their state survivability is, uh, is at risk. Fourth, the piece does a really, really excellent job in doing something that I don't think we've seen before or as uh, quite eloquently uh, phrased, the notion of the importance of senior military officers fully understanding the law, coupled with the role of lawyers in US military planning. You know, it's a really fascinating intersection between the rule of law and the importance of security. And of course, it didn't go unnoticed that the authors behind this paper, you know, we have a couple of political scientists and an international legal scholar, that didn't go unnoticed that these two, you know, fascinating kind of perspectives joined forces to write this really, really compelling paper. Finally, the notion of vengeance that the paper concludes with, specifically the all too human instinct for retribution and revenge, which may result in disproportionate retaliatory attacks. So there's a lot to uncover, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have five hours to take each of them in turn, but we are going to do our very best to kind of cover all of these and hear from you in the next hour. So my first question then is to both Scott and Alan, and that is, what were your motivations in writing this paper? Was it due to the timing? Was it due to the fact that, you know, maybe we should remind people out there that nuclear weapons still exist? And at the same time, as you're outlining your motivations, it would be really interesting if you could share with us what you learned about the process as you were putting the, getting the research together and as you were writing the paper, were you surprised by what you learned? So Alan, I mean, sorry, Scott, you first, and then I'll turn it to you, Alan. Well, let me start by saying, um, as a new member of the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin, I felt it was important to try to make a contribution on the 75th anniversary. And I think we can best um, honor the victims of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacks 
by reflecting on why we did what we did in 1945 and doing what we can to reduce the likelihood that such an event would ever happen again. Um, and frankly, I'm worried. Um, ben Valentino and I published in International Security in 2017, a survey experiment that showed that 60% of the American public would be willing to support a atomic attack on a uh, Iranian city today if they were put in a similar situation as we were in in 1945, contemplating uh, a ground war in which in that particular uh, experiment, 20,000 American soldiers' lives were at, were at risk. And then when Ben and I did that experiment, we found that um, even when you increase the number of casualties to Iranian civilians to 2 million, 60% of the American public still supported it. So I'm very worried that the American public has lost its sense of horror around nuclear weapons and has grown complacent. And therefore, it was important for, um, for Alan and Katie and me to, to do research about the, the 1945 situation um, and to reflect on, on whether we would do it today. And the, you, you asked, what did I learn? Um, well, I think one of the most important lessons one, one gets um, is when you look back at 1945, it's really quite stunning how um, loose control over the military there was in 1945. Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, found out about the um, firebombing of Tokyo from the New York Times. He did not approve it. It just happened. You, you had the broad outlines of what, what the military was supposed to do, and they went forward with their plans. What Stimson tried to do in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was to, first off, when he went to Potsdam, he made two requests to Harry Truman. First off, he said that, um, I'd like you to take Kyoto off the target list. He couldn't do it on his own. He tried and the military kept pushing back saying, no, Kyoto should be destroyed. It's the biggest city, it'll kill more people. Um, it'll be more dramatic and it'll be more shocking. And Stimson said, no, it's the, the, the um, cultural capital. It's the ancient capital. It's, it, it's such a glorious city that he had visited. And he asked Truman to take it off. And then say, secondly, Stimson said, to Harry Truman, um, I want you to change unconditional surrender to um, signal to the emperor that he won't be put on war crimes trials. And I think, Stimson said, that this would reduce the likelihood um, that we'll um, have to continue the war and maybe they'll surrender. Uh, Harry Truman agreed to the first, took Kyoto off the list, added Nagasaki, and uh, um, refused on the second. And I think that was partly because he thought the American public demanded vengeance against Hirohito, and partly because I think Truman himself thought Hirohito was a war criminal and deserved to be put on trial. And so Ellen and I end the piece by talking about why the laws of armed conflict are, are necessary to help stay the hand of vengeance um, and, and why we should think about law as an important constraint, not to reflect what our, um, human instincts are, but rather to constrain our all too human instincts. That's what I learned. Thank you, Scott. What about you, Alan? Well, for my part, so first of all, let me just begin by thanking Rachel Bronson and uh, um, Hallie Posner from um, the Bulletin and, and Sara Yu for organizing this event. Uh, really wonderful to have a chance to participate in this discussion with you. Um, you know, in terms of the motivations, I would say for me as an international lawyer, I was a practicing international lawyer in the legal advisor's office of the State Department for about a decade before joining the faculty at Stanford Law School where I now teach international law. And I would say one of the things that um, we, a central question uh, that we're always dealing with uh, if you're an international lawyer is, does international law matter? Does it constrain? Does it um, affect the behavior of states? And uh, you know, I'm quite convinced both based on the scholarship and the vast literature on this subject, but also from my own decade as a practitioner, that international law does affect, it does, it does shape, it does constrain the behavior of states, but it is at times a weak constraint, uh, or more precisely, it's a constraint that needs to be continually reinforced and needs to be continually re-educated. There's a reason why countries uh, abide by or adhere to join the various rules that are binding under international law. 
international law is consent-based, but uh, at a moment of crisis, at a moment of controversy, states will sometimes forget what the systemic interest in complying with a rule like only target military objects, not civilians, or avoid disproportionate attacks. And, and, and those legal norms that countries do see as in their interest and also normatively indicated need to be continually reinforced. And so being part of this piece, uh, which is aiming at trying to reinforce uh, those beliefs or those values or those norms, I think is, is really important. The second thing that I think is a motivation, just a little bit of insight baseball perhaps, but the chance to do interdisciplinary work like this with a political scientist like Scott and with Katie, people of their renown, um, is really, really gratifying. I think we, we discover um, that we live in, in worlds uh, that are a little bit stovepiped and we each see things through our own disciplinary perspective and the opportunity to collaborate uh, with somebody from a different discipline, I think is really, really powerful. I think lawyers um, tend to believe um, that uh, a lot of the legal principles that apply in the law of war context are very categorical, they're very general, uh, highly normative. Um, and I think political scientists tend to believe they don't really matter very much at all. And I think the reality is some combination of the two, which is, well, um, you really need to look at particular strategic settings or particular strategic contexts and particular potential uses of weapons to assess whether they are legal or not. And so uh, the chance to kind of do that work in practice. What did I learn? You know, many, many years ago when I was a young academic at Stanford, um, my old college roommate also is an academic. He was a, the late Tim Moy, he passed away tragically some years ago, but he was a historian of science at the University of New Mexico. And I was once at my home state of Colorado in the summer, I was driving, you know, in the Vail Valleys and I got a phone call out of the blue from Tim who said, was the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima legal? And I said, well, I have some thoughts about that, but I don't know. Let me look and see what was written up at the time. And what is astonishing is that there was really no formal legal evaluation in 1945 of the legality of the bombing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Um, again, the law was much more uh, nascent. It was much more undeveloped at the time, but there was no formal evaluation, which given my experience in government would have been inconceivable today. And, and so seeing how much transition there's been in terms of the integration into the operational planning process of uh, the law of armed conflict is interesting. The, the second thing that was really striking about uh, reading these documents was the ambivalence. You know, a lot of the norms or ideas that inform the law of armed conflict uh, are really about humanity, about minimizing the suffering and thinking about not attacking innocents. And you see those themes um, articulated in some of the conversations. And yet at the same time, they're um, swamped by this ambivalent desire to maximize as much destruction in Japan. And I found uh, the effort to try uh, to speak out of both sides of our mouth and to say that this is a military target while we're trying to uh, create as much shock as possible uh, to be really interesting to watch th that, that ineffective, ultimately, effort to rationalize what was going on. Great. Well, thank you both so much. So, and that was, it's almost as if this was perfectly orchestrated because what you just said, Alan, that provides a perfect segue for the question that I wanted to ask Scott. And that is, and Scott, you mentioned it as well in your room and your opening. If you could speak a little bit about the temporal perspective between 1945 and today, you know, Alan mentioned that you, one of the big questions is, you know, the question of whether it was illegal to have dropped the bomb in 1945. And while you're answering this question, when you're looking at this, providing this temporal perspective for us, could you also speak about the extent to which the roles of civilians, lawyers, and the military differed between then and now? Um, absolutely. Um, well, prior to um, the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima, we had already crossed the ethical Rubicon of, of bombing cities directly. Um, the Hague Convention um, uh, had tried to be supplemented, the states tried to supplement uh, the early uh, 20th century laws um, by having special rules about aerial bombardment 
but those uh, that effort uh, failed and there was no agreement um, about what would be the legal restrictions. So that as Alan put it, um, people making this decision had some views about this, but the military was going forward from, from early 1945 on with large scale incendiary attacks. So the idea about bombing with a nuclear weapon, um, what was not considered to be as grave a, a change as we would see it today. And there really wasn't a, a, a what today would be the judge uh, advocate general core. Um, you know, at the time of the Civil War, we had some, what, 12, I think, uh, lawyers helping the U.S. military make decisions. Um, and today, the um, Pentagon, the, or the Defense Department, is the single largest law firm in the world. We have judge advocate generals serving um, in most military planning units to make judgments about whether pre-planned operations are legal, whether they go uh, according to the um, laws of armed conflict. And, um, and it's a tricky evaluation. Um, some of the laws I've learned from teaching with Alan that uh, many laws are categorical or relatively categorical. They're like um, the rule that says you can't drive over uh, 65 miles an hour. But other rules are more like standards. They say you shouldn't, you shouldn't have a disproportionate attack or you have to take all feasible precautions. And lawyers have to make that judgment. Those are standards. Those are more like uh, don't drive recklessly. We don't know whether in similar situations how those lawyers would make decisions about proportionality, about precaution, and especially about the question about the ultimate war aims about changing a government um, versus having a peace settlement that is not uh, uh, an unconditional surrender. But we wanted to write this piece to remind international lawyers and to remind uh, JAG lawyers that in our judgment, such an act, even though it might be popular today, or even if you have a president who disregards international law, the important thing for JAG lawyers is to remind the president, sir, I can't do that because that would be illegal. Thank you. Um, lots to think about here. So Alan, one question that I'd like to ask you and looking at the chat that's coming in, I think this is going to, a lot of people are kind of like interested to hear about this. Is obviously, you know, I'd like for you to discuss the legal implications of the arguments that you put forward in the paper, specifically the ICJ. Where is the International Court of Justice in all of this? You know, we know in 1996, the ICJ had uh, released an advisory opinion on the legality of the threat or the use of nuclear weapons. What has happened since then? Has there been any kind of traction, any kind of noise, any kind of discussion in the ICJ as far as like the use or the threat or use of nuclear weapons is concerned? And along the same lines, could you speak to the gray area surrounding the criteria of when a nuclear strike against a legitimate military target could actually be deemed as legal? Uh, thanks, Sarah. I, I can try. So as you said, the, you know, the International Court of Justice um, did deal with the question um, in 1996 in an advisory opinion of, uh, regarding the legality of the use of nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, the court looks at um, a number of different um, potential bases for evaluating um, the use of nuclear weapons. It first asks whether the mere possession of nuclear weapons is uh, permitted or not, you know, based on various restrictions on um, uh, classes or categories of weapons. It concludes um, that, it did, that, that, they, that they are not so prohibited. Um, it looks at whether or not um, uh, it would comply with the laws of self-defense, and the court says it, it might. And then the court does spend some time, quite briefly actually, looking at what Scott and I are focused on in this paper, which is what the international lawyers call international humanitarian law, 
what um, American uh, JAG lawyers call the law of armed conflict and, and what many of us would just colloquially refer to as the law of war, which is the rules governing the use of weapons in warfare. And, you know, the court's um, decision in that case was really quite hedged. Um, some of the states argued before the court that there could be circumstances in which the use of nuclear weapons might be permissible. Um, it would depend on the circumstances. You know, and the court essentially says something like, well, we just don't really have enough information uh, before us to be able to uh, make uh, a, a definitive judgment. The court says the court cannot make a determination of the validity of the view that the recourse to nuclear weapons would be illegal in all circumstances owing to their inherent and total incompatibility with the law of armed conflict. So in other words, the court is tempted to do what I indicated at the beginning that lawyers often do, which is to deal with the status of nuclear weapons categorically as opposed to on a kind of case by case, situation by situation basis. Um, and it says, well, you know, we can't really answer that question, although the court says it seems in its minds, the court says it would be scarcely reconcilable with the rules of international humanitarian law, mainly the principle of distinction and the prohibition on unnecessary suffering. And the court says, so we, we, we can't really say, um, and then the court confuses in my mind uh, the law governing the conditions that allow you to have recourse to first force in the first place, use ad bellum uh, with use in bellum. And it says like, well, probably it's not permissible to use nuclear weapons, but maybe in situations of extreme uh, self-defense, it would be permissible. So there the court, rather than analyzing narrowly and specifically particular circumstances in which the use of nuclear weapons might or might not be legal seems to suggest that in grave circumstances of self-defense, perhaps it's okay to violate the law of armed conflict in some kind of a supreme emergency way, which I actually think is not the right way to read, read the law. So we don't focus in our paper on the ICJ's work very much because it's a very hedged opinion. The decision itself you know, has this uh, ambivalent character. It's also, uh, it was a judgment that was decided by a vote of seven to seven with the president casting the tie-breaking vote. So you don't get very strong or very clear guidance, um, in my view, uh, out of the ICJ opinion. Um, I'm not one of those people who believes that the use of nuclear weapons is, in all circumstances, um, unlawful. Um, I think it is conceivable, uh, particularly as we move uh, to uh, weapons that are um, relatively low yield and can be targeted very precisely. I do believe that there are circumstances in which nuclear warheads could be targeted against military targets that do not target civilians and could actually um, involve uh, military advantage, which, is, uh, which outweighs the civilian harm. So there are circumstances, and I think you really have to look at um, uh, scenario by scenario to kind of make, to make those kinds of judgments. All right, well, thank you. Okay, so I would like to encourage all of you who are on the call to, you know, start asking your questions. I see there are some already in the chat, but if you could, I've got like 10, I mean, I don't have 10 screens, but you're all on 10 screens on my, on my computer because there are so many of you, which is wonderful. If you could use the uh, raise hand function that Hallie mentioned at the beginning of the call, that way, oh, okay, brilliant. I see a couple of people have raised their hands already because I don't want, I mean, I'm happy to read all the questions, but we We'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So apologies ahead of time if I completely butcher the pronunciation of your name. Know that it comes from a really good place and I'm trying. So the first person whose hand I see is raised is Toshia Umahara. If you would like to um, say, ask your question, please. And again, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. No, you, you, you sounded, per sounded perfect. Um, thank you. Um, my question is about, uh, well, uh, more to do with the current status and then specifically about the, the, the ban treaty. Uh, I know the, the signatory has not yet reached 50, which is the, uh, the requirement for the treaty to take effect, but it's already 40. So within a year or so, it's highly likely that the treaty itself would take effect. Meanwhile, uh, I understand it's highly, well, it's, it, 
it's highly unlikely for the United States to join the, the BAM Treaty, but would, my question is somehow hypothetical, but would this treaty, if it were, in, if it uh, takes effect, would this be somehow, would this affect uh, US decision on the similar similar uh, situation like Hiroshima or Nagasaki on the body, uh, on the legality of uh, the attack. Thank you. Thank you. So is that your question to both Alan and to Scott or just to Alan? Well, yeah, it's mainly probably uh, because it's a bit legal. But uh, Mr. Sagan can also comment on 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 political implication, I suppose. Okay, great. Okay, so Alan, if you want to take it well, from... That, that sounds like a great division uh, for how we should handle this. So, um, you know, international law is quite different from domestic law. You know, when I teach my introductory international law class, I explain to my students that I was emphatically against um, the uh, reduction in the amount that you could deduct from your taxes here in California um, for state and local taxes, because we have very high taxes in, in California. And all of my elected representatives in the legislature also were against um, that um, proposed change in the law. But when the law was adopted by the Congress and signed in, into force by the president, I became bound by it, whether I favored it or not. Um, international law is for the most part quite different and it's consent based, which means that states are bound only by those rules that they accept. Now, one of the ways states become bound by rules is by signing a treaty. And the United States obviously has no intention of becoming a party to the test ban treaty. Um, a rule can also form through what we call customary international law, which is based on the widespread practice of states when that practice is based on a belief that what they're doing is legally required. And there are cases in which a widely adhered to treaty can be seen as generating practice that creates a rule that binds even states that aren't parties to that treaty. So for instance, the Genocide Convention um, has about 150 parties to it, not 190 as there are states in the UN system. And yet I think everybody would agree that the prohibition on genocide has now acquired the status of um, customary international law. So it depends on what states that have not signed the treaty do and say. And if they say, I just want to be clear, I don't consider myself to be bound by that rule as a matter of customary international law, then they won't be bound. And we've seen the United States and the UK and France already very emphatically you know, take that position when the treaty was negotiated, they issued a statement that said expressly, we don't intend to sign, we never intend to become a party, and we don't believe that uh, widespread adherence to this treaty could ever generate customary international law uh, that would bind us. So I think um, if the United States and the other nuclear um, states are vigilant, it would be hard for the ban treaty to um, impose legal obligations on them. Thank you, Alan. Scott, would you like to add anything? Well, I'll just add two points really quickly. One is not only have none of the nuclear weapon states joined, uh, signed the treaty, uh, but uh, none of the states that have a nuclear guarantee uh, in an alliance relationship um, with uh, a nuclear state, uh, they have all refused to sign the treaty uh, as well. So even if it, you do get the necessary numbers, it won't affect the people who have the most impact. Second, um, I'd say I'm personally concerned that um, this may have some um, unintended negative consequences at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. It is possible, I hope I'm wrong on this, but it is possible that some of the non-nuclear weapon states, rather than say, I want to put pressure on the US at, or other nuclear states to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons, to reduce numbers, to get back into arms control agreements at the NPT review conference, will say, well, look, we don't need to deal with the NPT bargaining process anymore because we have this new treaty that's even better. 
And I hope that doesn't happen um, uh, at the NPT review conference, but it is a distinct possibility and a worrisome one. Thank you. I see a lot of hands that are being raised, which is really great. Thank you. But before I call on the next person, Hallie, I know you wanted to jump in with an institutional reminder to everybody. Great. Thank you, Sara. Um, as a reminder, my name is Hallie Posner. I'm the program coordinator here at the Bulletin. And we ask that everyone please keep yourself on mute throughout the program unless you're called on for a question. But please keep your cameras on uh, as we are striving to build community and each of you is our community. If you have a question, as Sara has expertly mentioned, um, please use the raise hand function. Our moderator will see that and call on you. You can find this by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not physically raise your hand as there are too many participants on this call for us to recognize you in this way. Also, please note that we have many folks on this call, as Sara mentioned, so we apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. If you have already raised your hand, rest assured, we see you. A recording of this program will be available on our website in the coming days. Back to you, Sara. Great, thank you, Hallie. Okay, so I see a number of hands being raised. Um, so John Burrows, I'd like to turn it over to you, please. And if you could, and I was remiss to ask that before, I apologize, the caffeine is only just kicking in. John, if you could just tell everyone on the call who you are, um, if you could just tell us who you are and then go straight to your question, please. Thank you. I'm John Burrows from Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy in New York City. So the requirements that are focused upon in the article are necessity, distinction, and proportionality. Uh, but in fact, uh, these rules uh, afford quite a bit of flexibility in determining whether you know, a given attack is unlawful. Uh, the proportionality rule is found in protocol one uh, Article 51, uh, which says, among other things, that indiscriminate attacks are prohibited. It further says, attacks which employ a means of combat, the effects of which cannot be limited as required by this protocol, and are of a nature to strike military objectives and civilians or civilian objects without distinction. So there's a prohibition, in short, on indiscriminate attacks which have effects that cannot be controlled. So my, my question in particular to Alan Weiner is, why did you leave out the prohibition on indiscriminate attacks? Well, um, you know, I think I'll go ahead. I mean, I, I think I already mentioned a little bit in the previous answer. Um, you know, we have seen what is referred to as a, you know, as a, a targeting revolution, an accuracy revolution when we, um, when we began uh, developing um, the nuclear arms race, the United States had, uh, and Scott will correct me on the details, but the United States had missiles um, that had what was known as a circle error probable of, uh, that is to say, um, in 50% of the cases, the missile would land within a radius of, and I think it was, um, I think it was uh, uh, half a kilometer. Right, so um, you really were not able to place your missile um, directly on a target. Um, that circle error probable with modern missile technology um, is now down to several uh, meters. Um, and, and so it really is conceivable, I think, John, that there could be a remote, uh, a, a remote um, hardened underground silo uh, in, a, uh, in a mountain facility, and you could put a, a, a relatively low yield nuclear weapon on it, which would not have, I don't think, uncontrollable effects. Um, and I don't think that would be indiscriminate. I think it would be capable of distinguishing um, between a military, that's the goal that the, an indiscriminate weapon, as you accurately pointed out, which is one that it cannot distinguish between a, a military objective and civilian objects. And again, I think if you're striking um, missile field uh, in a remote terrain, I think it is possible to place a nuclear weapon um, discriminately um, that you can distinguish between military objectives and civilian objects. So again, um, I think that's why when we assess these kinds of questions, um, we need to kind of think about what is the actual scenario in which the weapon uh, would be used. Uh, 
uh, you know, a, a hardened underground facility in the desert. I, I, I don't think you can say that weapon, nuclear weapons are in all circumstances indiscriminate. I mean, we see that reflected a little bit in the courts, you know, the ICJ's judgment or advisory opinion that Sara asked about earlier. And if you, if you look at that, the court, you know, clearly has in mind the images that we saw um, that we grew up with of these massive weapons which raise entire cities. Um, but, but not all nuclear weapons are of that kind and not all um, strategic uses of nuclear weapons would, uh, would be of that character. Thank you, Alan. So Scott, I know you might want to jump in, but I know the next person has a question that's specifically for you. So if that's okay. Um, and so Orion Noda, I'd like to call on you because I know you had a specific question for Scott. So Orion, the floor is all yours. Um, <clears throat> hi, thank you for organizing this. My name is Orion Noda. I'm a PhD candidate from King's College London. And I have a question, as Sarah mentioned, for Scott, but Alan, feel free to jump in if you wish. Um, my question uh, kind of involves your 2017 paper with this one. So in your, paper with, in your paper with Ben Valentino, you conclude that the majority of the US population uh, would approve a nuclear strike on Iran if US lives were at risk. However, despite your mock scenario being perhaps the most likely, um, there is already a constructed bias, not to say blatant prejudice and intolerance against Iranians and Islam in general in the US. So my question is, how important do you think that is, that was actually for public opinion? And linking to this paper, um, do you think that US public opinion would be similar if the target were a more neutral, many quotes here, maybe a Western country, or uh, the main factor is the, the, like the loss of a uh, sense of horror of the bomb. Thank you. Well, first off, let me say that um, I think you are correct that the United States public has enormous hostility, uh, at least a significant portion of the public has enormous hostility towards uh, Iran as it does towards North Korea. Um, and that does have an influence on people's judgments. That said, those are the countries in which the United States is most likely to get involved in a conflict. So I think it's appropriate to look at those. It would be less, I would think, against um, uh, other countries in which we have more positive relations. Um, to go back to 1945, I would add, however, that I think it is um, a, a miss, uh, it's a myth that the United States would not have used nuclear weapons uh, against Germany. And that it was only because of the deep racial prejudice and, and, and super uh, hostile views during the war in the Pacific uh, that permitted the American uh, military and political leadership uh, to have large scale bombing. Um, I think the original planning included Germany. It's just that by 1944, when we were going forward with the final uh, decisions, uh, and do the targeting, starting the targeting policy decisions, uh, we already knew that by the time we got the bomb, Germany was going to be, un un was going to be out of the war. So that's why the, the focus of the targeting committee was on Japan. One last point um, that goes back to um, the earlier questions that Alan was answering. Um, Jeffrey Lewis and I have an um, article in Daedalus a few years ago called The Nuclear Necessity Principle which goes back to John Burroughs' comments about other aspects of the laws of armed conflict. And we argue in that paper that the principle of precaution, often called due care, that you have to do everything that's feasible to reduce collateral damage, means that the United States should, as a matter of principle, never use a nuclear weapon against a target that could, with reasonable probability, be destroyed with conventional weapons. We have proposed that, and one senior um, uh, retired military officer said, well, yeah, but if you do that, you're going to reduce collateral damage. And my response was, yes, that's the whole point. That's why we would want to do that. <laughs> and the individual said, well, if you reduce collateral damage, you will weaken deterrence. And my view is that if you're using collateral damage for political purposes or for strategic purposes, it's no longer collateral. It is deliberate and therefore would be illegal. 
Great. Um, Alan, I'm not sure if you want to add, but we're getting tons more questions coming in and I'm mindful of the time. So I see in the chat, Mariana Plum, you have a question. Um, I'm happy to read it, but I'd like to give you the floor. And this is a question that I think both Scott and Alan, you can answer because there's a legal component to it as well as a political side to it. So Mariana, the floor is all yours. Or maybe she's well, I will ask the question if I may. I know you're on, I, maybe you can't hear us. So the question that Mariana asks is, if tactical nuclear weapons are allowed, don't you think we will have another nuclear arms race and non-nuclear weapon states will have incentives to acquire them? And will that erode the non-proliferation regime? So Scott, if you want to take the first part and then Alan, if you want to take the second part about the erosion of the non-proliferation regime, that would be really helpful. Scott, you're on mute. Yeah, I do think that um, tactical or low yield nuclear weapons, I, I don't like the term tactical weapons because I think any use of a, a nuclear weapon would be a strategic um, decision and would have broad strategic effects. Um, that said, when you reduce the yield of, of nuclear weapons, it could create what political scientists or economists would call a moral hazard problem, that it becomes more tempting to use them. That adds to deterrence because it makes, makes a response more credible, but it also could weaken deterrence by making first use more tempting. And I think that's a dilemma. Um, I think from my perspective as a political scientist, um, there are many uses of nuclear weapons that would be lawful, but awful. That is, you could imagine that would be a legal justification, but that you wouldn't want to do it anyway because of its broader strategic implications. It would erode the importance of the precedent that we have. It's been 75 years since we used nuclear weapons. So even if you can imagine situations in which it would be legal to do so, I think you would, for strategic reasons, not want to do that because it would set a precedent that could erode the likelihood or could erode the, the non-proliferation treaty uh, and encourage other states to consider the use of nuclear weapons as well. Alan, would you like to add something to that? Or would you the only point I'll add is that, you know, um, uh, you know I, I share, you know, I, the, the fact that I believe that there are scenarios in which uh, the use of nuclear weapons could be consistent with the law of uh, armed conflict, you know, I think that sometimes then um, when I make that statement, I think it might be seen by some as suggesting that I think, you know, I, I support the use of nuclear weapons and I think I manifestly don't and, you know, believe I'm, I'm an adherent to the uh, a supporter of the idea of getting to zero. Um, and yet, given the nature um, of international law, the consent-based approach um, that I described, uh, you know, before, um, the fact that uh, something is a desirable policy outcome does not necessarily mean, um, in my view, that it is legally prohibited. And I think, um, you know, we just need to be kind of clear um, in, in, drawing that, in drawing that distinction. Okay, so we're coming close to the end of, uh, I was going to say the end of time, but that's probably not, you know, that's not appropriate given what we're discussing right now, but towards the end of our session together, and I'm going to try and get to as many questions as possible, but as Hallie, Hallie mentioned, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to get to all of them, so I do apologize. Stephen Schwartz, I know you had a question, so um, if you would like to um, take yourself off mute and ask your question, that would be great. I will. Thank you. Sorry, there's no video. I got a camera issue going on, but half of you know what I look like anyway, so it's not that important. No, no, no problem. Okay, so the question is, so to Scott's point, but Alan, you can weigh in too, um, about reminding current JAG lawyers that they have a responsibility to inform senior officials that certain actions are definitely illegal. Um, as you probably know, during the November 2017 remarkable Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing, former STRATCOM commander, General Robert Taylor, was asked how he would respond if asked to execute a presidential order to use nuclear weapons that he believed to be illegal. Uh, Taylor first noted that all of the numerous pre-planned options available to the president have been vetted by lawyers and are thus considered legal and justifiable. 
He then said if a president ordered a strike that he considered legally problematic, he would work to make it legal. And in an interview the same month, one of Kaler's successors, General John Hyten, who's now chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the exact same thing. And this was, of course, all in the context of what would Donald Trump do vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons. So given that, and the fact that the military only takes blast effects into account in its targeting plans and ignores firestorms, fallout, and so on, how confident are you that a U.S. nuclear attack today would not deliberately kill large numbers of non-combatants a la Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Um, I think that um, you did not quite accurately reflect um, the statements that um, both Kaler and, and Hyten made. They did not say we would work to make that legal. What they said was that we would say that that was illegal tell us what your objective is, and we will see whether we can develop a legal option to achieve that objective. Now, that assumes that the objective is not to deliberately kill lots of civilians. If it was, then the commander would have to say, sir, that objective is illegal, and that I would, by my duty, I would have to not obey a patently illegal order. If you say I want to attack a military target and I believe that there is, uh, it's so important that I'm willing to accept uh, high levels of casualties, then an officer would have to make a trickier judgment about whether that is proportionate or not. But if the president said, I want to, you to deliberately kill lots of civilians, I think an officer would be obligated to say, sir, that is illegal. And by my training, I have to not follow that order. A president would have the ability to fire that general and try to find somebody else who would follow the order. I think that's a severe danger. But I, I think that it is not accurate to say that um, the current commanders uh, would work to make an illegal order legal. They would work to try to find a legal mechanism to achieve the objectives of, of a particular attack. Um, and that would be, um, I think, the appropriate thing to do as long as the objective is a legal one. Thank you, Scott. So we have, again, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to get to all of your questions, but I'm going to take one more. And this comes from Jean Stevens. I know you dropped your question in the chat, but if you're on the call, I know it's not really a question, but it's a comment. And I think it's a very powerful comment for us to kind of end this uh, webinar. And so Jean, if you're on the call, would you mind like saying what you said in the chat to everyone here, please? Thank you very much for your time. I believe the only answer is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. The largest climate change organizations must join hands with Einstein devotee scientists to galvanize public opinion to the horrific dangers we now face. I live 45 miles downwind from Llano, Los Alamos National Laboratory. We need mainstream awareness. John Lewis and Dr. Martin Luther King were anti-nuke bomb devotees. The need, this needs to be addressed to the mainstream media, like tomorrow night's tribute to John Lewis that Oprah and Tyler Perry have organized via music tributes on CBS. Thank you for your time and letting me speak. Thank you, Jean. Scott Allen, would you like to comment on this? And then I will have to hand it over to Rachel, who's going to close out today's webinar. Well, I would just um, add by a note of conclusion is that um, the United States is a member of the Nonproliferation Treaty, and under Article 6 of the Nonproliferation Treaty, we have agreed that we will work in good faith towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. I do believe that um, the United States government has not always acted in good faith uh, towards that goal, but I believe that that goal is important and is appropriate and when individuals say that we need to work towards nuclear disarmament, they're also saying that the United States should follow the law because a treaty that has been ratified is United States law. And I'd like to remind people that that is a commitment 
And it's one that we should remind the public and remind our Congress people and remind administration officials that that's absolutely crucial. Thank you, Scott. Alan, I'd like to give you the opportunity to kind of give us a passing thought and then I promise you the floor will be yours, Rachel. Well, I mean, I think I echo those comments. Uh, again, I think the point, you know, that I tried to make before, um, given the way that international law works, it requires the consent of states and states are only going to um, accept those rules that they think are in their interest. And I think it means they're only going to comply with rules that at some point they concluded would be in their interest. And so um, I'm always a little hesitant. Uh, my whole approach as a positivist international lawyer is to try to draw a distinction between what is legally required or prohibited on the one hand and what is a good idea or a sound policy judgment on the other. And, and I think part of you know we're seeing in this distinction is although I uh, agree uh, very much that we would be better off if we lived in a world with nuclear weapons, it does not a fortiori follow uh, that the possession or all uses of nuclear weapons is illegal. So we have to have that, we have to do that work. Uh, we have to do that policy work. We have to persuade people rather than simply um, you know, sort of relying on, uh, on legal arguments that are perhaps um, uh, not as well-grounded as the proponents might believe. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Scott. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. So, Rachel, uh, the, uh, if you, the floor is all yours. Thank you. I want to um, thank my team at the Bulletin, Hallie Posner, Delilah Marto, Thomas Gulkin, and others who have worked hard on this, and our editorial team who work closely with Scott and Alan on this. Um, and their, their colleagues, Alan and Scott and Sara, thank you for taking time today uh, for this program. Um, I hope all of you um, on this call today will follow the bulletin this week in particular. We have a lot coming up recognizing the 75th anniversary uh, of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One of my ways from today's presentation is the fact that actually, um, Alan, you were really crystallized this, is that the legal issues are really important, but we can't rely on those. And I think you, you um, highlight that, that there's a really important role for policy and politics to make sure these weapons are never used again. And that the lawyers and the policy uh, practitioners and all of us on the call have our role to make sure that we don't use these weapons again because of the destructive power, as we all know, is so much more significant today than they were um, in 1945. And to Alan's point, if they're ever used in a limited fashion, there is absolutely, I believe, no reason we should have confidence that we won't very quickly go up the escalation ladder. And that's a political uh, reality, I think, that we're living with. So with that, keep an eye out this week in particular at the bulletin, but keep an eye on the bulletin uh, regularly and continue to support our work both through your uh, time and uh, your contribution. So we need all of that to continue to do this. Thank you all. Have a good week and stay in touch with us, uh, especially during this week. Thank you.